Your Bonhoeffer Moment, an open letter to Christians who love Bonhoeffer but still support Trump. Friends, I hope this letter finds you well, despite the distressing times in which we live. Moments like this remind me to give thanks for all we have in common as brothers and sisters in Christ. For that, and for all God's blessings, I am deeply grateful. I'm writing because I have been thinking about you a lot lately. As I have listened to the news, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, NPR, American Family Network, I try to expose myself to as many perspectives as possible. I have reflected on the phenomenon of Christian support for Donald Trump. Something of a turning point came for me this past weekend in a hotel room in Boston in November 2017, where I was attending the annual meeting of the American Academy of Religion. Resting between sessions on Bonhoeffer's theology, I was listening to the latest news reports on Roy Moore and his troubled candidacy for the U.S. Senate. A journalist being interviewed on one of the cable channels reported that in his conversations with evangelical pastors in Alabama, several conceded that even if it turned out that Judge Moore was guilty of seeking out and molesting underage women, they would continue to support him, presumably because sending a Republican child molester to the U.S. Senate is preferable to electing a Democrat. Over the next few hours, a lot of the feelings I have had since the 2016 election coalesced and took shape in this letter. What I want to say begins with a word of thanks. The older I get, the more I appreciate my evangelical Christian upbringing. Among the things it inculcated in me as a young teenager were a clear worldview and a conviction that what one claims to believe should be reflected in the way one lives. These and many other dimensions of evangelical culture have formed how I think about my faith and about the world. I no longer call myself an evangelical, but the break was more cultural than theological. I was a student at an evangelical seminary in 1980 as the Reagan Revolution was getting underway. For reasons I did not understand, Professors and students were abandoning the Sunday school teaching Southern Baptist Jimmy Carter for a divorced former actor with no discernible connection to the Christian faith other than a desire for evangelical electoral support. My skepticism about Ronald Reagan's sincerity was rooted partly in personal experience. I grew up in an evangelical church in Key Biscayne, Florida, where President Richard Nixon occasionally visited. Members of my church community were fans of Nixon in every sense. We liked his politics, and we loved the fact that he was a practicing Christian. We inferred this from his church attendance, his choice of Billy Graham as a spiritual advisor, and his friendship with our pastor, John Huffman, who on several occasions was Nixon's personal guest at the White House. At the president's request, our church held a special Sunday evening service to honor the Paris Peace Accords. It was televised live on the major networks. As you can imagine, Nixon's fall from grace and the disclosure of how duplicitous he had been, how caught up he was in the means-justify-ends world of politics, were devastating for all of us. No one was devastated more than John Huffman, who, after the Watergate scandal came to light, asked Nixon directly if he had known about the break-in. When Nixon swore to him that he had not, Huffman continued to support him. But when the transcripts of Nixon's White House recordings were released, Huffman was understandably shocked and outraged. If President Nixon claims to be a Christian, he told Time, he needs to repent of both the language used and the attitudes expressed toward people in those tapes. In an interview with the New York Times, Huffman went further, questioning the moral qualifications for the presidency of a person who cannot be trusted to tell the truth. I learned two things from this experience. First, I saw how embarrassing and demoralizing it was for a pastor I trusted and loved to realize that he had been played by a master manipulator who masked his quest for power with the veneer of evangelical Christianity. As a recent biographer of Nixon concludes, 
There was always a self-serving element in Nixon's relationships with evangelical leaders. When he knew he was going to run for president, he wooed them and they wooed him, the author writes. I guess such things are easier to see in hindsight. Second, I took a lesson in courage from John Huffman, who repudiated Nixon's actions in no uncertain terms, despite the high personal cost of doing so. The whole experience made me suspicious of politicians, who make piety part of their public persona, especially if I suspect they are doing so to solicit Christian support. It has also instilled in me an abiding respect for religious leaders, who are willing to speak truth to power. Despite this traumatic early experience, I was 15 when Nixon resigned in disgrace. I remained part of the evangelical subculture into my mid-twenties. Ultimately, however, I felt isolated from my evangelical friends and mentors on too many issues. Poverty, injustice, and racism, for example, to stay in the fold. I know that today many evangelicals are deeply concerned with these matters, but I did not find this to be the case at the time. By my late twenties, I was more comfortable in the Protestant mainline than in the evangelical church of my youth. But I have always retained evangelical sensibilities. These have been particularly helpful in my roles as teacher and pastor, although they have sometimes placed me out of step with my more liberal co-religionists. It's because I retained such an appreciation for evangelical Christianity and what it taught me, good and bad, that I feel obliged to point out some things that many of you seem not to have noticed or have hidden from yourselves. Take them as feedback from a friendly but critical voice, rooted in a combination of gratitude and concern. First, there is nothing remotely Christian about Donald Trump. I try to be charitable in my judgments of people I do not know, but this is the only conclusion I can draw. The question for the moment isn't whether someone's personal moral failings disqualify him or her from holding office, but just how serious and pervasive these failings are in the case of Donald Trump. I think Amy Sullivan said it best when she wrote that Trump is pretty much the human embodiment of the question, what would Jesus not do? Indeed, Trump's personal mottos, always get even, and hit back harder than you were hit, represent the antitheses of Jesus' own, which were, blessed are the merciful, and love your neighbor as yourself. Furthermore, neither his stable of evangelical advisors nor his White House handlers have had any success in controlling the flow of evidence that Trump's character is animated by the least Christian of qualities. Self-aggrandizement, enrichment at the expense of others, getting away with whatever one can, seeking to humiliate others, and spreading hate and suspicion. You taught me to judge people on the basis of their character, revealed particularly in the way they treat others. By this standard, Donald Trump is the least Christian political candidate in recent memory and everything you taught me about God and the Christian life demands that I despise him. Claims that he is rough, inexperienced, unrefined, or unused to governing are all true as far as they go, but they do not address the moral issue you train me to recognize and take with utmost seriousness. Behavior and language reflect character. And we see a bit more of Trump's character every time he bullies, belittles, lashes out, lies, or lies about lying. Just to be clear, I'm not criticizing Trump's specific policies, about which reasonable people, even those who are faithful Christians, can disagree. I could construct spiritually and theologically based arguments that Trump's policies are unchristian, indeed inhuman, but you could defend his positions on similar bases, and in any case, this would take us into the realm of partisan politics, where people dig in their heels and stop up their ears. So I will simply reiterate the point I want to make. Every part of my evangelically shaped heart is revolted by this man, whom you voted for and continue to support, come hell or high water, or worse. <laughs>
I will sharpen the point by observing the following. Regardless of how much you try, you cannot turn Donald Trump into a real Christian. Putting it this way reflects how you taught me to think about such things. Being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a barn makes you a cow, was a favorite adage in my evangelical youth. The point was that churches are filled with nominal Christians, while real Christians, those who regard prayer, worship, evangelism, and discipleship as non-negotiable duties of the truly committed, are much harder to find. This way of judging people's religious commitment was deeply inculcated in me, along with the belief that cultural Christians embody a form of cheap grace that undermines the church's witness. Even if he sometimes attends church and reads his mother's Bible, Trump has not publicly indicated a desire to follow or honor Christ. Thus, I have to conclude that, according to the definition I learned from you, he is not a serious Christian. Those he has co-opted by naming advisors have tried to fudge this issue by speaking of Trump as a baby Christian, but it is difficult to be convincing when the one on whose behalf you are fudging, asked about his personal faith, says things like, Our religion is a very important part of me, and I also think it's a very important part of the country. Many of you were frustrated with Barack Obama's failure to clearly express his faith and demonstrate his Christian bona fides. But Obama showed more familiarity with Christian ideas, language, and culture than Trump has, despite the latter's conscious efforts to court the evangelical vote. It's not just his inability or unwillingness to articulate his beliefs. Nothing about Trump suggests that following Christ is or has ever been important to him. Despite the assurances of starstruck evangelical leaders, they want us to trust a feeling they had while they were in Trump's presence, while asking us to ignore his public treatment of people, his habits, and his words. I remember being asked rather pointedly as an evangelical teenager, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? This was another way of making the point that one's faith must be reflected in one's life, or it is ineffectual and bogus. In Trump's case, no objective person would take the accusation seriously. Based on recent polling data, a majority of you are not concerned by these matters, as you now believe that a candidate's personal behavior should not disqualify him or her from holding public office. But because this opinion conflicts so profoundly with the evangelical worldview you shaped in me, not to mention the beliefs you yourself held until recently, I can only regard this shift as disingenuous and self-serving. These things mattered to you a great deal when Reagan and the Bushes were in office, and they certainly mattered during the Clinton and Obama years. They mattered during the 2016 primary season as a phalanx of Republican candidates sought your votes by flashing their evangelical credentials. And they mattered when you were campaigning against Hillary. So when, exactly, did character stop mattering in our assessment of political candidates? Some of you have said this election was too important to let issues of personal morality determine your vote. I might be able to accept this if you held your nose, pulled the lever for Trump, and then been ready to disclaim him when he began to act in ways no Christian can condone. But so many of you have stayed on the Trump bandwagon, unwilling to acknowledge even to yourselves that you are being taken for a ride by someone with only the most cynical attachment to your faith. Which leads me to observe the following. Your fierce embrace of Trump has begun to do real damage to American Christianity. At the end of Trump's first year in office, there is evidence that your support for him has taken a toll on the credibility of our faith. This has been pointed out by many secular critics, including a psychologist who recently wondered, based on an election cycle in which he observed, an especially high level of insincerity, shamelessness, poor judgment, and pathological egocentricity, whether evangelicalism itself has become sociopathic.
But your support for Trump is also troubling other evangelicals, some of whom have begun to distance themselves from the brand, as it were. Peter Werner is a case in point. He recently wrote that support by white evangelicals for President Trump and Roy Moore has caused him to rethink his identification with both evangelicalism and the Republican Party. He accuses prominent Christian leaders of becoming Trump courtiers and concludes that the term evangelical has been so distorted that it is now undermining the Christian witness. An evangelical journalist recently made the credible claim that you actually represent a new religious movement called Fox Evangelicalism. At the heart of this new religion, she writes, is the nationalistic, race-baiting, fear-mongering form of politics enthusiastically practiced by Mr. Trump and Roy Moore in Alabama. She describes regular Fox News viewers as taking in a steady stream of messages that conflate being white and conservative and evangelical with being American. The resulting religious identity is then weaponized in support of virtually any policy, so long as it is promoted by someone Fox evangelicals consider on their side of the culture war. Increasingly, there is talk of a generational schism within your community, based in part on older evangelicals' support for the debauched pagan in the White House. Younger evangelicals are rightly appalled by the hypocrisy of their co-religionists, who care a lot about character, except when they don't. The result is what one evangelical writer has called a generation of theological orphans, alienated from their immediate forebears, to whom they are saying, we reject your idolatrous politics, your nationalistic faith, your moral subjectivity, and your fear of the alien and the stranger. In recent weeks, the volume has been dialed up on warnings about how support for Trump is damaging evangelicals' credibility. The point of no return may have been reached, with reports that Trump carried on an affair with a porn actress while Melania was at home with their newborn child, and then bought the woman's silence. For many of us, This news simply confirmed what we suspected about Trump, that he had used and would use any means necessary to get what he wanted, regardless of who was injured in the process. What has shocked us is how evangelical spokesmen like Tony Perkins and Jerry Falwell Jr. have continued to cover for the president in the aftermath of these latest revelations. I suspect that nothing these men say in the future will carry any credibility beyond the circle of their closest supporters. These leaders' responses to this latest scandal have led some to claim that we are now seeing evangelicalism's true colors. Support for Trump, they say, expresses not evangelical loyalty to the Republican Party, but long-standing commitments to racism and sexism. It is not surprising that contemporary leaders are blasé about reports of Trump's infidelity with a porn actress, Michelle Goldberg observes, when we recall evangelical support for segregation. For despite his louche personal life, Trump, the racist patriarch promising cultural revenge, doesn't threaten the religious right's traditional values. He embodies them. In this view, Trump has revealed the evangelical movement's true priorities, which, according to Goldberg, include the preservation of traditional racial and sexual hierarchies. In the wake of the same scandal, Michael Gerson writes that Trump evangelicals are playing a grubby political game for the highest of stakes, the reputation of their faith. He notes that unlike Billy Graham, John Huffman, and others who were snookered by Richard Nixon, Trump's court evangelicals have made their political bargain with open eyes. According to Gershon, They are surrendering the idea that character matters in public life, in direct exchange for political benefits to Christians themselves. I believe there will be real, long-term damage as your ongoing support for Trump weakens the evangelical movement from within and without. In addition to estranging younger evangelicals, 
you risk undermining your claims that Christianity stands on the right side of modern movements for righteousness and justice. I suspect this desire to demonstrate Christianity's moral credibility is part of the reason you are attracted to the courage and witness of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Which brings me to my fourth point. Your embrace of Trump is eerily reminiscent of German Christians' attachment to Hitler in the early 1930s. I make this point not to convince you that Trump is Hitler, but to remind you of the troubling ways Christians have compromised themselves in endorsing political movements in which they perceive the hand of God. I developed a scholarly interest in the church's role during the Nazi era, in part so I could help ensure that Christians would never repeat the mistakes they made under Hitler. Similarly, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my heroes, in part because he was able to resist the wave of Hitler worship that swept up many German Protestants. Being familiar with this history, I have been struck by how reminiscent many of your responses to Trump are. Of the way Christians in Germany embraced a strong leader, they were convinced would restore the country's moral order, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Many Christians in Germany let themselves be persuaded that Hitler was a deeply pious man, placed in power by God through a graceful act of intervention in German history. Hitler encouraged these ideas, not by claiming any allegiance to Christ, but by employing vague religious language, promising a return to the good old days, and posing for photographs as he left church, prayed, and entertained ecclesiastical leaders. Here are a few examples of how Protestant Christian leaders in Germany spoke about God's role in Hitler's accession to power. With National Socialism, an epoch in German history has begun that is at least as decisive for the German people as, for example, the epoch of Martin Luther. No one could welcome January 30, 1933 more profoundly or more joyfully than the German Christian leadership. Adolf Hitler, with his faith in Germany, as the instrument of our God, became the framer of German destiny and the liberator of our people from their spiritual misery and division. Hitler is the best man imaginable, a man shaped in a mold made of unity, piety, energy, and strength of character. Hitler, the most German man, is also the most faithful, a believing Christian. We know that he begins and ends the course of his day with prayer, that he has found in the gospel the deepest source of his strength. If the German who truly believed in Jesus could find the spirit of the kingdom of God anywhere, he could find it in Adolf Hitler's movement. In the pitch-black night of Christian church history, Hitler became like a wonderful transparency for our time, a window through which light fell upon the history of Christianity. God has granted us an hour of grace through Adolf Hitler. God has once again raised his voice in a singular individual. Compare these statements with those made in recent months by American charismatic and evangelical leaders. God raised up Donald Trump. Michelle Bachman. God has righteously chosen Trump to affect the way that this nation goes forward. Chuck Pierce. Donald Trump represents a supernatural answer to prayer. James Robison. God has raised up Trump for such a time as this. Stephen Strang. Donald Trump actively seeks God's guidance in his life. James Dobson. Trump's victory showed clear evidence of the hand of God on the election. Franklin Graham. Trump is a bold man, a strong man, and an obedient man. Kenneth Copeland. I see this as a last-minute reprieve for America and the church. Rodney Howard Brown. Trump does look like he's the last hope. Phyllis Shafley. God was raising up Donald Trump as he did the Persian king Cyrus the Great. Lance Wallnau. Trump is a man of faith, truly committed to making America great again through principles that honor God rather than defy him. Stephen Strang. In the midst of despair came November the 8th, 2016. 
It was on that day that God declared that the people, not the pollsters, were going to choose the next president of the United States. And they chose Donald Trump, Robert Jeffress. We thank God every day that he gave us a leader like President Trump, Robert Jeffress. How is Trump able to convince these Christian leaders that he is worthy of their support? Mostly by paying attention to them, inviting them to Trump Tower, and indulging their need to be listened to in an increasingly post-Christian culture. It is truly remarkable that they have been taken in by Trump's vague and barely comprehensible statements about his faith, such as, I've always been spiritual, belief is very important, and I'm going to do a great job for religion. Honestly, Hitler was better at pretending to be a Christian. Given how often many of you have cited the German church struggle as a model for church-state relations in recent years, it is ironic that you do not seem bothered by these leaders who are repeating the mistakes so clearly displayed by German Christians in the wake of the Nazi revolution. Like those naive and desperate Germans, these American Christian leaders theologically justify nationalist fervor, fail to stand up for those being scapegoated by the state, including members of the Christian community, and fear being called unpatriotic, as if this were worse than denying Christ. Of course, knowledge of German cultural history provides some insight into why Christians would support Hitler in 1933. Their country had long been mired in economic depression, political dysfunction, and national humiliation. Even if they hadn't supported Hitler, when it was possible to do so in a democratic election, once he was appointed chancellor, they were hopeful that his personal charisma and outsider identity would allow him to turn the nation around. Hitler's promises to reestablish the country on its religious and moral foundations made it easier to risk supporting him, despite his totalitarian leanings and hateful rhetoric. But once they jumped on the Nazi bandwagon, Germans found it difficult to admit that they had made a mistake. By the time they were pushed to the threshold of resistance, it was too late. Likewise, evangelicals who voted for Trump can be given the benefit of the doubt for acting in rational self-interest, given the options. Perhaps, as some have argued, initial evangelical support for Trump was driven by prudential judgment and fear of a Clinton presidency, rather than by blind acceptance. But if evangelical support for Trump was contingent, surely the time has come to admit that the gamble was a failure. The superficial curated projections of the candidate, to which we had access during the election campaign, have now vanished to reveal the character, the spiritual essence, if you will, of the man. I think we can agree that it is not pretty and gets uglier with time. Looking back, it is painfully obvious that Christians who embraced Hitler as Germany's last chance were determined to see what they wanted to see. Hitler as the new Luther, the long-awaited savior, the God-sent redeemer, who would make Germany great again. They clung to these fantasies even as Hitler showed his true colors and exposed his bogus piety. If these things were difficult to see at the time, it was because the alternatives were so bleak. Which leads to my next point. I accept your claim that you could not, as Christians, vote for Hillary Clinton. I regard this as a principled stance rooted in the belief that behavior and character matter, as well as certain political convictions that for you are non-negotiable. If you are one of those evangelical Christians who simply could not, as a Christian, vote for Hillary, I will not ask you to consider what role Russian propaganda played in your view of the Clintons. I will simply acknowledge that you found yourself in a truly difficult situation in which party loyalty became less important than the moral burden of having to choose between the lesser of two evils. But if you truly felt that both candidates might be evil, I would point out that you were obliged, as a Christian, to extricate yourself from this moral quagmire. 
either by refusing to vote at all, or by risking a vote for one of the candidates, and depending upon how that person governed, being prepared to renounce him or her. In other words, you were obligated to do everything in your power to ensure that the evil you had unwittingly helped unleash on the country would be mitigated by people like yourself, who still believe in evil and believe it must be resisted. Or, you could have written in the name of someone whom you could support with a clear conscience, even if voting for that person left you open to the charge that you had assisted in electing one of the evil candidates. Voting in this way surely would have felt like an abdication of civic responsibility, but you would have had the satisfaction of knowing that you followed your Christ-inspired conscience. In the words of Bonhoeffer, you would have acted in the confidence that your decision to vote for a writing candidate was an effort not to extricate yourself heroically from a situation, but to take responsibility for how the coming generation is to go on living. You would have voted your conscience in a way that placed you out of step with your friends and colleagues who humility would compel you to admit, might be seeing things more clearly than you. But, like Bonhoeffer, you would have demonstrated the courage and foresight to dissent from those around you, not the least of whom were trusted religious authorities, and take a stand for Christ that carried no guarantee of being recognized as such by others. This would have been difficult, but it would have been a real Bonhoeffer moment. You would no doubt have experienced, as Bonhoeffer did, isolation and loneliness, even tortured uncertainty. But you would have had the spiritual comfort of knowing that you took an unpopular stand based on your effort to discern God's will in that moment. It would have been your private Bonhoeffer moment, since you would have done the thing Bonhoeffer might do if he were in your place. Perhaps you failed to seize your first Bonhoeffer moment by voting for someone you suspected did not deserve the support of a serious Christian. Perhaps you have come to regret this decision. But there will be other Bonhoeffer moments ahead. Before they arrive, I hope you will begin to listen to your Christ-inspired gut feeling about political candidates, before co-opted Christian leaders give you permission to support them, and consider that your uneasiness might be the way Christians are supposed to feel when confronted with candidates whose words and behaviors suggest deep character flaws, not to mention woeful ignorance of the faith they are supposed to espouse. If none of the candidates in an election meet your standard, does it matter whose name you write in? I recently browsed through the official results of Alabama's special Senate election. Given the highly Christian populace of the state, I was surprised that among the 22,852 write-in votes, which included votes for Mickey Mouse, Mel Brooks, and Gus Malzahn, Auburn's football coach, Bonhoeffer's name did not appear even once. One certainly makes a statement by writing in names like Beyonce, Bugs Bunny, or Buffett. Jimmy and Warren both received multiple votes. But imagine the statement a Christian voter could make by writing in Bonhoeffer. So the next time you are presented with a slate of candidates, consider each one on his or her merits. If you find that you cannot, as a Christian and a responsible citizen, vote for any one of them, write in Bonhoeffer. That will be a Bonhoeffer moment you can feel good about.